Hey friends, I'm Scott Hanselman. I want to talk to you today about productivity in the time of the coronavirus. I've done a few talks on productivity in the past, but never in a situation where we're all forced to be remote from home. So I think that means that this talk needs a refresh. I'm doing this talk with the help from our friends at Plain Concepts who have set me up with these wonderful Azure Connects. So I can do this on a virtual stage. I've got all this great equipment that I'm going to ship back to them once this talk is over. But hopefully that'll make you feel a little closer to us here at the conference and to those of us that are presenting because I think this is an interesting way to do a talk. It's not quite just a webcam. Maybe gives you a little bit more of an in-room feel as I try to get used to what this virtual stage feels like. It's pretty fantastic and it's powered by Azure AI and all the code is on GitHub so you can check it out. All right, let's talk about productivity. There's a big myth out there about how we are supposed to be productive and there's even been some conversations about being productive uh, when you're quarantined, it should be a requirement. You should try harder. There's been some interesting memes and some tweets that have said things like, what's keeping you from having a GitHub uh, graph that looks like this? Or what's keeping you from learning another language? Or what's keeping you from being more productive? And I think being quarantined is definitely that. This level of productivity that we're seeing here with a wonderful office and a perfectly organized life is obviously silly. That's not how it really is. This is an example of what quarantine work really feels like. It's a lot more overwhelming than I think people want you to know. So I think we need to uh, address that straight on. Again, I've said my name is Scott. I've got a website and a blog and a number of podcasts, and I've done a bunch of things that make you feel like maybe I'm very, very productive. But I want you to feel welcome here, and I don't want you to think that that is 100% real. We're not 100% productive all the time. And uh, this idea that you should just do it, you should try harder, uh, you should hustle more, and the reason that you're not being productive is because you're not trying hard enough, I think is unfair. And I think it's worth pointing out that hustle culture, you should hustle more, may not be healthy. You don't wake up, kick butt, and repeat. So let's just start by acknowledging the fact that remote work is different than quarantine work. We don't always find ourselves in an idealized scenario. I've been a remote worker now for almost 15 years. I've always been remote and I've been in an office that's just over there. Well, not in this virtual world, but it's in my other, my other room. Remote work is freeing, it's powerful, and it gives you a sense that I can do it. But quarantine work is a kind of a tiny prison in your own home. You don't get to go to a cafe and sit down and work on things. You can't collaborate with folks unless you decide to bubble up with them. So first we have to acknowledge that if remote work and quarantine work are different things, then maybe the expectations of productivity should be different as well. There's a lot of pressure to overwork and people have done a number of analyses that show that people who are working remotely during a time of quarantine, feel pressure to uh, go to more meetings, work late. If I'm working from home, then I don't have a commute. So that hour there, an hour back, or whatever I was doing on my commute that was making me not productive means that I'm working even harder. And that can be really, really stressful. And I think it's important that we acknowledge that as information workers and as developers. The other thing that is happening a lot right now is that 2020 kind of sucks. So we're finding ourselves doom scrolling, just scrolling infinitely through our social media, enjoying our impending doom. The problem with that is it doesn't move the ball forward. It doesn't make you feel better. It doesn't help your psyche. It doesn't help you get to sleep. And it certainly doesn't help you get the job done, whatever that job that you're doing might be. So I want to start by just acknowledging that doom scrolling is a thing and that we should maybe avoid doing it for our mental health. One of the things that I really feel strongly about is this idea of, of a deliberate practice, trying to be as intentional and in the present as possible. A lot of the things that I'll tell you in this talk on productivity may be things that you already know about. They may be things that you've thought about or that you find intuitive. But the number one thing that I want you to take away from this talk is the idea of being intentional and saying, huh, just take a beat, take a moment and go, yeah, was that a good use of my time? No, it wasn't. I will not do that in the future. Or, huh, yeah, Scott's right. Or so-and-so is right. Maybe I need to uh, include a tool 
to measure how I spend my time. All of these things recognize that as with, as with all advice, you don't have to take the advice, but also recognize that maybe there is a moment for some deliberateness or some intentionality in the things that you do to be more productive, whether you're a developer, a program manager, a product manager, a marketeer, or an information worker in some way. First thing I like to encourage people to do if you are working remotely, as I am, as we all are right now, or many of us, is to make a nest, make a place. This is my office, this is my place that I sit. A nest could be the kitchen counter or the dining room table, it could be uh, your laundry room, honestly, it could be anywhere, but is, has it been made an intentional place for you? You don't need to necessarily spend a lot of money, but have you set up your lights? Have you set up your monitor? Have you set up a chair at the right height? Has it been built as a nest is built with intentionality? Take the time to do that. Think about your space. Think about your monitor. Think about your butt and where you put your butt. Is your chair, your monitor, your desk a place that you can spend time? Are you getting up every hour to move around? Are you getting in your steps, getting your stand rings and your activity rings? All of those things require a consciousness. And as time seems to drag on, we find ourselves sleeping through days and that can hurt our bodies and our minds. So I think is a piece of advice that is valuable. And then ask yourself as time goes by, as you are remote working, what is the time to create? Is this the time to, to create? Is this the time for you to write that book, write that program, write that piece of software? For me, I've been really enjoying you know, doing YouTube, so that has been a time to create for me. But there's been other things that don't feed my spirit, so I've backed off from them, and that's important. As you're also thinking about a time to create and be more productive, you might ask yourself, why me? Why is Scott saying that I should go and do uh, a talk or a book or a blog or a video or a podcast. Well, the thing to remember is that as you're going through this, everyone is an expert at something. You are an expert at your personal experience, and that's the thing I want to hear about. I don't want you to be an expert at Python or .NET or machine learning, but I'm interested in um, your expertise in learning those things. So tell us about your journey. If you're looking for a time to create, if you're sitting at home in quarantine and thinking that maybe this is the time for me to start my blog or my video podcast. Maybe tell us about your journey and that would be great because everyone is an expert at something. And don't be overwhelmed with the idea that uh, you need to be an expert or a professional. There's no professionals anymore. My degree that I got 20 years ago was useful but it only taught me how to think. It didn't make me an expert in any of the languages that I currently program in because those languages didn't exist when I got that degree. So if we accept that there's no professionals and that we're all just amateurs, I think things get a little bit more, uh, a little more uh, open and a little more reasonable as we decide to go and create and be productive. The other thing worth pointing out is not to be intimidated by people who have 20 years experience because do we know if it's 20 years or maybe it's just the same year 20 times. If you're not being deliberate, if you're not intentionally going through your life and your career, thinking about each day, each week, each month, and each year, then sometimes you can lose weeks, months, and years, and you may find that, yeah, you may have been around for 5, 10, 20 years, but it was the same year. There was no growth. There was no forward motion. So learning is more important than producing in that context. And above all, stay curious, stay excited about technologies like this virtual stage that we're blessed to be using today with the help of our friends at Plain Concepts and Azure AI. So this is the YouTube that I've been excited about. I don't know why I got excited about it. It just happened, but I listened and I paused and I heard myself say I wanted to make a series of videos. So I'm doing a, a YouTube and a website here called Computer Stuff That They Didn't Teach You. I made it a YouTube channel, but I also put it at a URL, which is creatively named computer stuff that they didn't teach you.com, which hopefully will be easy to find because it just redirects to that playlist on YouTube. That was the thing that made me happy. Question for you to ask yourself is where's your network? Is it LinkedIn, like my friend Grace? Maybe it's Twitter. You don't have to be on all of these places at once to feel productive. Go to the place that feeds your spirit. And if you can't find that place, that social network where your people are, maybe you need to build that place. Surround yourself with people who lift you up and don't spend any keystrokes or time on people that tear you down. So how do you scale yourself? 
How do you be more productive at work and at home? How do you manage your time? Because we're all given the same number of hours. Well, I like this really famous quote, the less you do, the more of it you can do. What a wonderful quote. Who made that quote? I'm going to make that a quote. Let's see. It was me. I was the one that said that quote. It's a great quote, so I'm going to make that a famous quote right now. I think it's important to note that it's okay to be a funny little knife that isn't amazing at everything. You don't have to be the expert. You can be like a Swiss Army knife, but at least get the basics right. Be a good knife if you can't be a decent pair of scissors like a Swiss Army knife. So as I'm trying to figure out how to be more productive, I'm thinking about what the basics are. and I don't want to skimp on those. So how do I scale myself? Well, uh, back in the day when I started out, there was just this much information. There was these two books. There wasn't any Google or way to do that. But now there's a ton of information. I actually showed someone this screenshot here and they said, wow, this person really has their life under control. And I was like, why do you say that? Well, they've only got 148 emails in their work inbox and only 13,000 in their Gmail. Sometimes I've seen all nines or I've seen the, the phone icon or the messages icon to be all nines as well. I find that stressful. I don't know about you, but I would rather not have that much unprocessed information coming at me. So the idea here is to increase productivity while reducing stress. So let's ask yourself, how much of your day is spent context switching, being interrupted, meetings that maybe could have been an email, or just generally panicking in what I call thrashing to disk. That's when your memory on your computer gets filled and it just starts beating on the disk. That can be overwhelming, and I think that happens to humans as well because we're really single-tasking machines. We're not multitasking machines. The other thing to watch for when you're thinking about productivity is personal danger signs. Are you missing deadlines? Are you being overwhelmed? Do you feel like a failure? Here's the thing that I know that is a problem for me when I say I need to catch up. I just need to work late, just tonight, just in, you know, October is a busy time, October, November, December kind of area, that time frame, January, February, March, April, May, June, kind of that July, August, September is a busy, busy time. I'll just work late tonight and then I will catch up. If your work day has become 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. and then you put the kids to bed and then it's 10 to 2 in the middle of the night, then that can be a danger sign that you could potentially be in trouble and you want to start saying no to things because you hope it'll be better. But we have to acknowledge when we're honest with ourselves, that hope is not a strategy. Now, as such, I like to take apart two words. These are some of my favorite words in English. And I think they're interesting because when I give this talk in other countries, I get to talk about their local language. And we have found that the word effectiveness and the other word that we'll talk about in a moment, efficiency, uh, are sometimes the same word in those countries. And that's really interesting. So effectiveness is doing right things. That's setting a goal. It's being goal oriented. For example, if you're a runner, if you're Usain Bolt, the world's fastest man, for him to be effective, he needs to pick the direction that he is running and he needs to run in that direction. If he picks the wrong direction, even if he's off by a few degrees, he will miss his goal no matter how good a runner he is. Efficiency which unfortunately sometimes translates to effectiveness in other languages. So you have to think about these two words, parse these words out. Even in English, they're difficult. Efficiency is doing things in an economical way. That means that you have a good input to output ratio. So if we go back to the example of a sprinter, sprinting efficiently would mean not looking at text messages while running, uh, not being interrupted, doing one thing and one thing well, making sure that the process is good that is a process-oriented maneuver. So, taking the fact that these translations sometimes both mean effective or both mean efficient, we can say to ourselves, effectiveness is doing the right things and efficiency is doing things right. Usain Bolt picks a direction, that's being effective. Now, running really well in that direction, faster than anyone else, that's efficiency. So when we think about those things and we apply them to ourselves, we might say to ourselves, is this an effective person? Well, maybe he picked the wrong direction to jump. Now, when we think about something like an inbox, we have to be really effective as we triage the information that comes in. Information that comes into an inbox, where an inbox might be uh, your Outlook and your Gmail. That's a kind of an inbox. But an inbox could also be GitHub issues, Jira issues, issues in a Trello board. It's any information that is flowing into your life. It has to be triaged. 
Triage is a really interesting word. I like linguistics and I like parsing words like this. Triage is a French word that means to separate or to sort or to sift. Usually when we think about triage, we think about it in the context of a war. I like to think about it in the context of zombies or the walking dead. This image here on the right hand side is a toe tag. And if there's a crisis or a big issue or the zombies are coming, we have to take that toe tag and we see, is this person hurt? Are they the walking wounded? Are they dead? We have to be ruthless in order to survive these zombies. When information is coming at you, that is an email, you need to go quickly. Am I going to do this or am I not going to do this? Am I going to delete it? Am I going to forward it to someone else? We have to ask ourselves questions and be ruthlessly efficient about how we are going to triage that information. So if we take that and we apply David Allen's threefold nature of work, where there's three different kinds of work in the world. There's predefined work, work that you set up ahead of time, you scheduled. There's work as it appears, where someone just interrupts you and says, hey, here's some work. And then there is the work of actually defining work. If we then apply that and think about his four Ds, you can do the work, you can drop the work, you can delegate it, or you can defer it. Things start becoming really, really interesting. Now, if we take that, David Allen's do it, drop it, delegate it, and defer it, and then put that on axes, similar to Stephen Covey's highly effective people axis, where we have an axis uh, going vertically here that says importance, and a horizontal axis, axis saying urgency, then we can see that things that are both urgent and important should be done right away. That's the do it now. The house is on fire. Something's happening. Do it now. Things that are urgent but not important, maybe that can be delegated. It's not particularly urgent right now. We can maybe do it later. We can have someone else do it. If it's important, if it's not urgent, we can decide to do it. We can schedule it. But the most important thing and the thing that allows you to scale the most is when something can be dumped. It is neither urgent nor important. So why are we doing it? Why do we find ourselves doing that kind of trivial work sometimes? That can be a little bit frustrating. Well, trivia is neither urgent nor important. Twitter, the web, often news, while it feeds our serotonin receptors, it's not particularly important to be done right now. Here's a good example. This is a mouse with an electro electrode going directly in its brain that feeds its pleasure center, the sense of being okay. And it just has to push that lever to refresh a sense of well-being because it's trying to find that well-being from an external source. All it has to do is just pull to refresh and pull to refresh. You might see that pull to refresh metaphor a lot in your social media apps. I find myself doing that as well. Just one more mention, just one more news article. That's where I have to catch myself acting like that mouse in a cage and maybe back off of social media a little bit. Because any system that works well is a system that has flow control. The internet itself has flow control. And that allows us to drop packets. The way that systems that get overloaded manage traffic successfully and continue to work is by dropping packets. Communication itself is fault tolerant. It is asynchronous. So sometimes you can just let go. Say no, stop doing something, and you'll be better, more healthy, and uh, you'll live to fight another day. Sometimes dropping the ball is the right answer. One of the things that I like to drop first are the things that cause me what I call psychic weight. Sometimes your uh, list on Netflix or the shows that you want to watch, uh, your TiVo or your direct, uh, your, uh, your digital video recorder that records television shows and lets you know that a new season of something has appeared. Have you ever had a situation where you've been working on something at work and then a new season of a show that you like drops all at once? They say that that's binge worthy. They say, look, an entire season of a show is available and I'm going to start watching it right now. And it, it stresses me out. I found that the psychic weight that presses down on my forehead that tells me that I need to watch that show right now is incredibly stressful. And that means that I'm not going to get the work done. So the quickest way to reduce that psychic weight is to say, no, I'm not going to watch season seven of Lucifer or whatever just came on because it's not helping me move forward with my goals. And that's where intentionality comes in. 
it's okay to want to watch those shows. It's okay to waste time. It's okay to sit on your butt and watch Netflix. That's the anti-hustle culture. And sometimes it's just healthy. It's a way to recharge. But the thing that I'm asking that you do is you just simply acknowledge it, be intentional about it and say, you know, I'm gonna sit in my butt and watch TV today, but I know what's gonna happen if I don't. I'm gonna do it intentionally and deliberately. I'm gonna give myself that gift and I'm gonna schedule that time. We'll talk about feasible multitasking a little bit later and what we could potentially do with that time while we give ourselves the gift of, of media, of TV shows and of movies. But if you can stay um, rooted in the now, then you can start thinking about how you can make your day successful. I really like the rule of three that J.D. Meyer from gettingresults.com talks about. He says, write down three outcomes for your day. Write them down for the week and for the year, and the scope of those is gonna change. I like to think about what are three things that I could do today that would make my day awesome. If that doesn't work for you, you could invert it, and you could say, why did yesterday make me feel bad? Why did my work make me feel bad about myself? And can I design a system where I don't feel bad about myself? What would a day look like if it was awesome? What are the things that I could do in the order I could do them so that I could have quick wins and big wins over the course of the day? The number three is important because sometimes picking 10 or 15 or 20 things is overwhelming and you're not gonna get 20 things done today. So get three done and optimize them and order them in such a way that they wanna make you feel better and make you feel successful. Then think about how those things that you're gonna to do today build upon the things you're gonna do over the course of a week, a month, and then a year. And take little bites out of big things and you'll eventually get them done. Another thing that J.D. Meyer talks about at gettingresults.com is this notion of having a vision for your week. Monday morning, 9 a.m., I sit down and I pause and I breathe. And I go, what's the vision for a week? What would make this week awesome? How would I get that done? And I think about all the things that need to get done, both personal and professional, in work and outside of work. And I think about what would the day feel like if I got that done? And then on Friday, I reflect back on the week. And I say, you know, here's what worked. Here's what didn't work. I didn't do good at this. I didn't do well at that. I'll forgive myself and I'll remember that each new Monday is another day to start over and make it, make it right for the next week. So you have a vision of your week, you reflect on your week, and then you do it all over again. Some people are too busy. They're too busy to hang out with you. They're too busy to help you with work. Timothy Ferris, who is a bit of a productivity person himself, feels that being busy is a form of laziness. That might be overstating it a little bit, but I do think that uh, being overly busy, being overwhelmed, can show uh, an amount of indiscriminate action. An indiscriminate action is the inverse, the opposite of what we talked about at the beginning, which is deliberate action. Do a thing because you decided to do a thing, not just because it happened and it came upon you. Sometimes we'll find that our friends will disappear for a while and they'll come back and, what were you doing? Well, I, I wrote a book while I was gone. Oh, I went off into the woods and I worked on some open source. David Rakoff, RIP, said being creative and making something is the opposite of hanging out. Sometimes I make the sacrifice to not hang out with uh, a friend, but I'll be deliberate about it and I'll say, hey, I'm really working on something important. I'm heads down, I'm doing this great YouTube, let's talk next week. And I balance those things because other times I'll say, you know, I'm not gonna work on my YouTube today, I'm gonna go see my friend because I'm being intentional about what feeds my spirit and about the time that I wanna spend and how I'm gonna spend it. This is a great, cartoon at xkcd slash 386 where we talk about how someone might be wrong on the internet. If someone is in fact wrong on the internet, maybe you just need to let it go because that's not where your keystrokes belong today. So once you start making good decisions about being effective, about doing uh, the right things, how can you do things right? Then we move towards being really, really efficient. I really feel that one should identify all of the different data streams that come into their lives. Slacks and Teams and DMs and emails and text messages and all the different things. Try this. This is a bit of homework for you. Take those things and sort them. Signal versus noise. What are the things that come into your life, the data streams that come into your life that add the most value? What are the noisiest? What adds no value? Then what do you do with those noisy things? 
Do you maybe go into your phone settings and turn off the notifications? Do that. Literally take a moment and do that. Go into your settings and say, you know, all that thing does is bug me all day and all it does is interrupt me and it adds no value. I'll look at that app when I get around to it. Most apps like Outlook and Teams have quiet hours. Why are you bothering me when I don't want to be bothered? Take a moment to do that. Even better, set an appointment with yourself to go through and audit all of your data streams and say what packets can be dropped from these streams. I sort my list and I thought about the things that matter to me. I spent a lot of time on the phone. I used phone to say Skype and Teams and video calls and things like that because I like, I like talking to people. That works for me. But what I do is I'll take that list and I'll then chop a section of that list depending on what I'm doing and what I'm trying to focus on. So I might throw Twitter and um, television away completely for a week and that gains me hours. Oftentimes we'll find ourselves saying, I wish I had more time. I wish I had another hour or two a week. You can get that hour or two a week by removing other hours. Saying no is the number one way for you to gain time in what you're doing. You can go through your email rules and filter things. I find that people get overwhelmed very easily about their inbox. You'll notice that sometimes if something scrolls off the, uh, the bottom of the page, you'll never get it again. So then the only thing that really matters are the emails that you can see. That's certainly a problem. So how can we make filters that are a little bit better than that? I believe very strongly in one main rule to rule them all. I've actually got three or four here, but the number one thing that you could do to improve your work email and personal as well, but primarily work email, is make a second inbox. By that, I mean make a folder, name it inbox CC, and then make a rule that puts mail that you are carbon copied on, that you're CC'd on, in that mail. Notice here that I've got 240 emails in my inbox, but two thirds of them I've just been CC'd on. People are CC'ing me because they're saying, hey, FYI, this is a thing you should look at. Here's the trick. I only look at the CC'd mail a couple of times a week. I made a third one because my job works with the community a lot, so I have inbox external. You'll notice that it's in fact empty. That's because email from external people outside my company matter the most, so I've checked them all. I've also got another one that is a search mail to check all of my bosses. Three up means my boss, my boss's boss, and her boss's boss. And then big ass mail because I don't want to fill up my email. I've got things with attachments in there. Number one rule that will change your life is having items that you are to on to be on your main inbox and items that you've been CC'd in its own inbox. Uh, and also you might say, well, what happens if someone CC's me on something and I need them to to me? Let them know. You teach people how to treat you. Tell them if it's really important, you put me on two, and if it's an FYI, put me on CC'd and I'll get to it in a couple of days. Here's a nice challenge for you. This is some homework. Try this once. Trust me, try it. Don't check email in the morning. Get to work, whatever you do. Don't touch your phone, don't touch your email, don't open it up. Sit down, what are you gonna do? What's the thing you need to do? What's the project, what's the doc, what's the code that you need to write right now that involves not checking email in the morning because checking email is just the fastest way for you to teleport uh, to two in the afternoon. Uh, one other way to put this would be don't put energy into things that you don't want more of. If you don't want more email, try sending less. We'll talk about that in a little bit because I think it's important to conserve your keystrokes. Do you know that your keystrokes are in fact a precious commodity? You don't have a lot. You have a finite number of keystrokes left in your hands before you die. That's a really awful and sad thing to say, isn't it? You know that you have a certain number of breaths. You can breath, breathe, and go, okay, I breathe this many times an hour. I live to be 100 years old. I have a billion breaths left or whatever. Well, you can go and figure out at keysleft.com how old you are, how fast you type, and it'll tell you exactly how many books are left in your fingers. Are you spending your time appropriately? So when it comes down to email, why are you sending that email? Maybe that email needs to be a document or a knowledge base or in your company Q&A. Maybe that email needs to be literally anything but an email. So think about that. If you only have so many keystrokes, what are you gonna do with them? If one of you lovely folks here in our virtual stage in our virtual auditorium and our virtual conference decides to send me an email and says, hey Scott, great talk, I loved it. I have a great question for you. I might say, wow, awesome question, but I don't know you. 
I'm not going to give you 2,000 keystrokes, but the question was really good. It doesn't make the question less valid, but I don't want to email you and work on it for a half an hour and then have you email me back, thanks. That is not cool. Instead, I will make a blog post or a knowledge article or a, a FAQ or a SharePoint or anything and then send you a link to it. And now my keystrokes multiply, which is really, really exciting. So take a look at keysleft.com and find out how many keys you have left. Sometimes we have to deal with physical things, not just digital things. You have to deal with physical objects. Um, that can be a little bit overwhelming. Everyone has a drawer or a pile of USB cables. I think the trick is to, for any medium, find a trusted source and put it there. That means take a, a medium, uh, pieces of paper, bills, anything, whether they be digital things or physical things, and find a place for it. But it should be just one place. You shouldn't have six places for all your USB cables. You should have one place. You shouldn't have one, uh, six places you keep your bills or your taxes. You should have one place. And then keep it available. Keep it nearby, open and updated. It could be a to-do.txt file for all I care, as long as it's regularly managed and maintained. That's what's important. Another thing that I think is interesting when one wants to be efficient is why we manage our teams in sprints, but often we don't manage ourselves in sprints. Try scheduling work sprints for yourself. Sometimes life can be completely overwhelming and feel like this. It doesn't have to if you think about something like the Pomodoro technique. A Pomodoro is a little uh, timer, a little tomato-shaped timer that has 25 minutes on it. Sometimes they're called egg timers. 25 minutes is your new unit of time. If someone says, hey, can you work on this for me, this, this email or this document, you say, sure, I can do that. That looks like about two Pomodoros. That's two 25-minute blocks with five minutes in between to use the bathroom or whatever. It's not 30 minutes, it's 25. And here's the trick, you have to sit down, you have to turn that timer on and you only get to do one thing. You do one thing for 25 minutes, you have to focus for 25 minutes. And you will find, just like push-ups, it's surprisingly hard to do that. Do it for 25 minutes and then if you find yourself interrupting yourself, those are called internal interruptions, you have to be aware of them. This gets back to that notion of intentionality and thoughtfulness. So you observe them. You accept that they happen. You said, oh, I just interrupted myself. I was thinking about playing solitaire. I'm really good at solitaire. The other thing to do is to think about external interruptions. Are you being texted? Are you getting notifications? Is there a piece of toast popping up on the screen to bother you? Acknowledge it. Maybe write it down and then remove it. You do not need your email popping up to tell you that you have email. You check email when you want to check email. You don't have email check you. Your boss is bothering you regularly, multiple times. Can you ask them to stop? Can you have office hours? Can you have core hours? Can you set an appointment with yourself to focus, to give yourself that time? How can you reduce the number of both internal and external interruptions? The goal in all of this is to try to remain in your flow. The fundamental principle of flow is that important things will find their way to you multiple times. The worry is that we have FOMO, fear of missing out. So FOMO has us checking Twitter, checking social media, checking email, because we can't be quiet in our own heads and just listen to the flow. If you remain in your flow, you get wrapped up in the thing that you're currently working on, you will find that you'll be a more productive person and you'll get the thing done faster and easier. Single tasking is better than multitasking. Sprinting is better than a casual walk in a certain direction. Apparently that's what that looks like. There's a funny tweet here where this person said that the worst app on their phone is the one called phone where they have to talk to people synchronously one at a time with other humans and that suck. Well multitasking is a lie. In fact single tasking is the way to do it. There's only so many things you can do when you multitask. Um, you can walk and talk, that's multitasking. You can maybe walk and chew gum. You can maybe check your email while you stand in a queue, but for the most part, multitasking is unsafe and scary.
definitely not the kind of multitasking that you want to be doing. So what can you do? Well, you could maybe use Outlook and listen to your email, have your email read to you. You could use Siri or Cortana to dictate your email back. If you do still have a commute during Corona, you could even have a fake commute. I made myself a fake commute where I leave my house and I walk around the neighborhood and I walk back to work. And I do that while listening to, to email to long form audio. Those are things where we can do that is allowing us to utilize idle time. But for the most part, multitasking isn't really a thing. It's just context switching at speed, which is proven to be ineffective. There's really not a good time to do much multitasking. That's actually a pretty good time to, to multitask. Another thing to watch out for is that you're sitting at home all by yourself during quarantine. Are you setting up systems that guilt you? Kathy, Sarah, warns us about these guilt systems. If you have a pile of books or papers that you're telling yourself you're going to read and you end up just rearranging them, changing their order, changing the stack and the height of the stack as you move them around, but you're never going to get to them. If you have a book that's been on your desk for a year and you're telling yourself you're going to read it, but it's underneath three other books that you're not going to read, remove them. Get them off your desk because you're never going to read those books. And that's okay. Accept that. Maybe set up a pile of books that you're actually going to read and then read those. Don't set up guilt systems, set up success systems and acknowledge yourself that you don't scale. You can't simultaneously be current on all things and the news and tech and all the different things and also get the things done that you want to get done. Intentionality will allow you to acknowledge these things and say, you know, I am not going to be able to be the expert on politics or the expert on science or the expert on whatever topic I'm interested in that's not moving the ball forward in my life or in my job. So I'm going to let those things go. Acknowledge that you don't scale and then let someone else guide you. I like to find um, experts that have already done the work for me and then I ask myself, let's say I'm learning Python. I could get stressed out and upset that I'm not going to learn every little trivial detail of Python, but I could learn the things I need to know or I should know. Maybe you do .NET for your job. Well, you need to know these things, you should know these things, and you might want to know edge cases because it's your job. So if I'm learning Python, I'll just do the need to know stuff, and then I know when to stop. But my job is .NET, so I need to know all the way down to the edge cases, and I also enjoy it very much, it feeds my spirit, so I'm going to also learn useless information about .NET as well. Make a list of the things you need to know and acknowledge that you're not going to be fluent in all of these different topics and all these different languages at the same time. And then from a news perspective, and if an emergency happens, you'll hear about it. Don't have toast or text messages alerting you to things that are happening. This is the equivalent of doom scrolling with notifications, where you're constantly going to be interrupted by things telling you that bad stuff is happening. If something important happens, they'll let you know. But if bad things are happening, you should probably just ignore them at this point. Seriously, though, look at your news feeds and audit them. Now, if you want to do this kind of measurement and do audits of your, uh, your life and the technologies and the techniques that you're using, you need to find right tools. And you can't really cut stuff out of your life unless you measure how you use them and how you use the time. So the thing I recommend is rescuetime.com. It's a really cool application that runs in the background as well as a Chrome and Edge extension that looks at the things that you're doing, the tabs that you're running, and then you get to categorize them whether they're productive or not. You decide what your productivity is. Are you writing a book? Are you writing some code? Are you working on a uh, PowerPoint deck? Whatever the thing you're doing is, you decide what's productive, and then Rescue Time will say, hey, you worked for eight hours, but you only actually worked for three hours. You were on Reddit, you got interrupted, you were on phone calls. Use these tools not to set up systems of guilt to make yourself feel bad, but use these systems to instead let you know that you can potentially make changes. These are not about measuring tools and charts and graphs to make you feel bad. These are about tools to allow you to then reflect, remember that Friday reflection, and say, you know, I read a lot of news this week. I'm going to block the news site so I can focus on the thing that's important to me. For physical things, I really like this idea of 43 folders. You get a bunch of manila folders, actual physical folders, and when a, when a ticket shows up or an important tax document, you have 31 folders for the days of the month, 1 through 31, and then 12 for the months, and then you make a circular buffer. 
So you have 43 folders, 31 for the days, 12 for the months, and then you put your things in them and then you never lose a physical business card or an object or any time-based thing as you move through that circular buffer of things. Paper is actually greater than you realize. Paper never runs out of batteries. Paper's got a retina display. So sometimes when I get overwhelmed with my iPhone or my uh, Surface machine, I go and I sync to paper. I sync everything onto the paper and I write it down and that allows me to get more grounded in what I need to be working on. So when I look at that Monday vision, I'm doing that in fact on paper. Electric paper is useful as well. I'm a big fan of OneNote and OneNote for iPhone because this gets to my original point where I said keep these things open and available in one medium. You throw everything you want into OneNote or everything you want into Git or everything you want into a text file, but make sure it's available everywhere. So if inspiration hits, you have a moment. If I'm on my walk, I can open up OneNote and I can say, oh, I had a thought, and I can put it in OneNote immediately. You want to make sure that you don't lose useful information. Always available to you. That way it releases your brain from the stress of trying to remember these things. Any Kanban style board, whether it be Azure DevOps or Trello or whatever, you can use to move things forward and backward. And I also recommend physical Kanban boards, which just means post-it notes and a board or a wall that you have available to you. Instapaper is an interesting one. A lot of people have a thousand tabs open and that can be overwhelming. This is another example of intentionality. Opening a tab implies that you're going to go back later and read that tab. What Instapaper does is it changes the idea of opening a tab from the idea of reading something later. So I made a bookmarklet that then sends papers and tabs that I'm going to read later. It sends them elsewhere. It sends them into Instapaper. And there's Pocket and other Read It Later tools. And then Instapaper will send that to my Kindle at the end of the week as a document that I can read. It's almost like I collect links and I collect information all week long and I throw it into Read It Later. And at the end of the week, I get a nice document sent to my Kindle or a PDF emailed to me and I can then read that at my leisure. Any kind of things, any kind of things that I can um, automate where I don't have to build a system that involves a lot of manual steps is super useful. I really enjoy If This Then That. Uh, Zapier is another one. Microsoft Flow are all systems that non-programmers can use to automate repetitive tasks. If I post something to my Instagram, put it in my Dropbox. If someone updates this row in this Excel sheet, send an email to that person. Try to avoid doing repetitive things and you'll catch yourself uh, wasting time. You'll then automate it and then you'll get more time back. Uh, we found on our team that we got about two hours back that we didn't realize we were doing of just endless copy pasting and clicking that could have been turned into a web-based workflow like this. I'm a big fan of Dropbox. This is in fact a picture of all of the presentations that I've given since the late 90s up until now, all organized in a folder. And it's only because I started with a system and I stuck with it. Now that could be Dropbox or OneDrive or Box or whatever, but what's interesting here is the folder organization. I kept it simple and I kept it in one place. There are not 50 different folders called presentations. There's one folder called presentations and I put all my presentations in it. There's a gentleman named Christopher Hawking who had a great quote, but he said, if it's not helping me make money, I'm gonna cut that out and I'll just say, if it's not helping me to, and then I'll put a blank there, you decide, is it helping, if it's not helping me to feel healthier, connect to my family, get promoted at my job, if it's not improving my life in some way, then it's mental clutter and it's out. That's how you decide what to cut. That cut can be friends, toxic family members, bad bosses, bad habits, whatever. What's your goal? And what are you going to delete from your life to get you closer to that goal? That's a thing to think about. So here's your homework. Homework. I want you to audit your sources. I want you to schedule work sprints. Turn off distractions. Go and consider uh, what you're doing with your time. I want you to be intentional. Feel free to take screenshots of all of these things and ask yourself, am I being efficient? Am I being effective? Am I doing what I need to be doing? And then as you're all home, and uh, as we are all quarantined together right now, together apart in our own homes, uh, try to put out good work, share your energy. Don't waste your keystrokes on negative people or negative things. Share your experiences, 
be kind above all else things and try to put out good energy both at work, at home, on social media if you use it and uh, hopefully it'll come back to you. I want to thank you for spending time with me today on this virtual stage with the help from our friends at Azure AI and our friends at Plain Concepts at this wonderful conference and I'll see you later.